Hidden away in a Sydney vault is a young pickled pup. For almost 140 years, it's remained locked in its glassy tomb. But this is no ordinary pup. In fact, it's not a pup at all. It's a foetus of an animal more closely related to an Australian kangaroo. A marsupial, which looked like a dog, had stripes like a tiger, yet carried its young in a pouch. How the Tasmanian tiger, or thylacine, came to be extinct is a tragedy. How it may live again will be due to a miracle. We have in that pup the seeds, the capacity, the time capsule to bring that pup back, bring thylacines back through the DNA preserved in that animal. This is the story of one man's quest to reverse extinction. Using the DNA extracted from this bottled specimen, Professor Mike Archer wants to clone a Tasmanian tiger. Our story starts just south of Australia, on the island of Tasmania. It's a land of craggy mountains, wild rivers, and mysterious forests. For millions of years, it's been isolated from the rest of the world, disconnected by the barrier of oceans and the tyranny of distance. In its impenetrable wildernesses, there are still valleys which have probably never known the foot of man. Like mainland Australia, Tasmania has its kangaroos, wombats and wallabies, marsupials that carry their young in pouches. But there was one Tasmanian animal that's no longer found on the mainland. A ferocious flesh eater that terrorized all the other beasts. The thylacine. For millions of years, this wolf-like marsupial was the island's chief predator. Yet it wasn't a wolf, and though it had stripes like a tiger, it wasn't a tiger either. But the name stuck. They also called it the Tasmanian tiger. But today, only its ghost remains. For over 60 years, there's been no confirmed sighting. Its mating call is no longer heard crying through the forests. Little remains of it except photos and museum specimens. There are skins and taxidermist's models, some still showing the bullet holes. For the thylacine's extinction was quite deliberate. A state-inspired extermination fueled by irrational fear.
About a thousand kilometers north of Tasmania is Sydney. One of the city's oldest institutions is the Australian Museum. Its director is Professor Mike Archer. On his own admission, he's obsessed with the thylacine and its fate. We should feel dreadfully guilty about what happened here. This was the, the really most beautiful, spectacular flesh-eating mammal in Australia, and the first thing we did when we got here was exterminate it. Which is why he has set out on a bold experiment to try and reverse extinction. If he can extract DNA from this museum specimen, maybe one day scientists can clone a thylacine. The specimen is a thylacine fetus, a female, preserved or pickled for almost 140 years in a jar of alcohol. Now it's about to give its genes to science, which means releasing it from its liquid tomb. Out. And the secret lay in the alcohol. If formalin or formaldehyde had been used, its DNA would have perished long ago. Ah, well, we have liver, actually. Oh, really? Oh, great. And there was another secret. Its intestines were removed to help preservation. Fortunately, whoever did it left most of its other organs intact. And we have heart and lungs. Uh, lungs. It's a race against time. It cannot be out of its preservative for more than 30 minutes or the effects of the alcohol may start to wear off. Oh, well, we can take more tissues than we thought. Each time the specimen's handled, there's a risk of contamination. All that's needed is one fleck of human skin to fall in and they could find that they're getting DNA from the wrong animal. This condition's not too bad, considering it's been in alcohol for 100 years or so. So, if they want pure thylacine DNA, its internal organs are the best option, preferably those still protected by natural membranes. So the kidneys are fortunate too, and they sit in their own little sacs as well, so they can be hopefully less contaminated than some of the other tissues. Kidneys, liver, heart, bone marrow, all provided good samples. Hopefully they'll also yield good DNA. Now, we want to put some fresh alcohol back in this, don't we? They had met the deadline. The pup would be back in its jar well within 30 minutes. So how many samples have you got? Uh, uh, ten, eight, ten, ten tissue samples and uh, two, two bone marrow samples. But while alcohol preserves DNA in the short term, no one knew what effect it would have over all those years. What if the DNA had disintegrated? What if nature's code to build a thylacine now looked like this? If Mike Archer's dream is ever to come true, he'll be putting back into these forests an ancient link, an animal whose evolutionary history goes back to a time when Australia was still attached to Antarctica. This has got to be one of the most significant forests in the whole world. Antarctica looked like this 55 million years ago, as beautiful and richly forested as this. The ancestors of the first marsupials that came into Australia marched across this country. The ancestors of the bandicoots, the possums, and even the thylacines exploded in diversity in a brand new land. To understand where the thylacine came from, we must go back millions of years to when its ancestors ranged over the great southern supercontinent of Gondwanaland. 
Australia isn't the only continent to have marsupials. They're also in the Americas. Animals like the Virginia opossum, a distant marsupial cousin of the kangaroo. And they also lived in Antarctica until about 37 million years ago, when the climate changed and their habitat disappeared under the ice cap. Tasmania is actually a piece of Antarctica that escaped the big freeze. Millions of years ago, it was dragged north by Australia. Its shattered scarps, fragments of a trans-Antarctic mountain range, snapped apart during this titanic rift. When Gondwana land broke up, Australia and Antarctica were the last continents to separate. 90 million years ago, we find that they are still attached. But Australia had moved into more temperate latitudes by 27 million years ago. Soon, it would move into the arid zone. Which explains why a landscape once inhabited by rainforest animals now looks like this. And in this limestone desert in Queensland, northern Australia, this is where they left their bones all those millions of years ago. Firing! It'll be on zero and you won't hear the zero. Three, two, one. <laughs> so we're your scatters. Mike Archer is not just a museum director, he's also one of Australia's leading paleontologists. Well, gives us a lovely interface of events that was going on in this um, cave or whatever it was. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff, isn't it? Riversley is one of the world's finest fossil sites, and the bones he and his team have found are rewriting Australian animal history. It might be a femur, uh, one of the, the, uh, the leg bones. It, looked, it was vertebra shaped. But it's just the interior of that, which looks like a little forest, beautifully preserved trabe trabeculae. It's magnificent. It's typical uh, camel sputum quality. They are finding evidence of a whole range of extinct megafauna. A giant marsupial rhinoceros. A carnivorous killer kangaroo. Even a ferocious marsupial lion. But more fascinating still, 27 million years ago, in what was once a teeming rainforest, they also found evidence of thylacines. This is the beginning of the thylacine story. We found a beautiful bit of a jaw with a magnificent tooth in it. You can just see that lovely thing standing proud above the bone there. It, it has so much to tell us. That tooth is a very primitive thylacine tooth. The deep time story of thylacines, which we find written in these rocks, is something that you simply cannot get from looking at the last 200 years of understanding about thylacines that Europeans had. What we find in these rocks is anywhere upwards of five to six different kinds of thylacines, tiny little ones, medium-sized ones, generalized, specialized ones. This was the thylacine's finest hour. And as we come up through these rocks, what we discover is that slowly they're being chewed away at. They're losing their numbers, they're losing their kinds, so that by about eight million years ago, there were only three kinds left. By five million years ago, only one kind left. And finally, by 4,000 years ago, the last thylacine on the mainland died out, leaving it only in that final fortress of Tasmania. But time started to run out for the thylacine in Tasmania at the start of the 19th century with the arrival of British settlers, among them Mike Archer's own ancestors. With them, they...